Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? It's great to see you all here today. My name is TJ. I'm the program coordinator here at the Library and Observatory. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to say welcome, uh, to say how great this collaboration has been with Friends of the Desert Mountains. Um, and I also wanted to let everyone know uh, before we start today's program that this uh, we're really into the meat of our programming season right now. So we've got a lot of great things coming up, including every single day this week, we've got a, a public program here at the library. So thank you. Uh, so we hope to see you uh, at some of those. Tomorrow we've got uh, the last in our Who's Afraid of Opera series. So that should be fun. That's at 2 p.m. Uh, and then Wednesday evening, we've got a really special program in collaboration with The Living Desert. Uh, we'll be doing a screening of the documentary, uh, The Woman Who Loves Drafts. Uh, and it'll be followed by a Q&A with uh, the woman who is actually featured in the film, uh, Dr. Anne Innistag. And she is an incredibly um, inspirational figure. And I can't speak highly enough about, uh, about the film and what a great... Um, great thing it is so it should be a really special night uh, so we encourage everybody to come check that out as well that's at 7 p.m. Well, doors will open at 6 and then on Thursday uh, we have a concert great music performance in the evening at 7 we have uh, Sean Gaskell who will be playing the West African Chora so that should be a really unique concert uh, and then on Friday we have our poetry group from the library doing their annual poetry reading so a lot coming up, and we hope to see all of you at some of those events. Um, if you have any questions about program or ideas for programming, um, don't hesitate to let us know. You can you can call or email me or stop in and ask for TJ, and I always love to hear, hear your ideas. So, uh, But with that, I want to bring up uh, with Friends of the Desert Mountains to introduce today's speaker, Ms. Ada Knuckles. Welcome everyone to the Rancho Mirage Library for, to the series of lectures being offered to you by Friends of the Desert Mountains. Friends of the Desert Mountains is celebrating its 35th year here in the valley to help preserve and conserve all kinds of the desert floor and do a lot of scientific studies along with it. Um, my name is Ada Knuckles. I am a volunteer with Friends of the Desert Mountains and I help to get the programs such as this up and for you. The hike program, we also have our other volunteers who do the trail stewardship and the weed warriors to take care of our environment to help re have native habitat restored for the uh, wildlife in the valley. So today, in order to help you learn about what conservation is in the Coachella Valley. I'd like to have you welcome Kathleen Brundage here. Kathleen is with the Coachella Valley Association of Governments and she has been working in our desert for 20 plus years. She is an environmental ecologist. She has done field biology work and lots of other things. She's also uh, been working at UCR, Palm Desert Campus, and she is a COD instructor as well. So please welcome Kathleen to learn about the 27 species of concern and endangerment within our environment. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathleen Brundage. I go by KD, Kathleen Dawn. So please feel free to uh, approach me and say, hey, KD, how's it going? Um, at this point, I am the Director of Conservation for the Coachella Valley Conservation Commission. And I have been out here in the desert for about 20 some years uh, working on developing protocols for our different desert species and our habitat conservation plan. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the plans developed and then go into what we do with the plans. And so um, let's see if this works. All right. To begin this story, you really kind of have to know how special this place is. So our desert area, our desert region, is part of one of those little red pimples over there, a biodiversity hotspot. 
So many of you have probably seen this map before. Um, it is through the Nature Conservancy. And the reason that the, these little bumps are so important is not because you know, nothing in the gray is important. There's plenty of species and natural communities that are important here. But in these areas, they tend to be really stressed out with urban development. Um, and there's so many endemic species in these areas that are under those stressors that other ways of conserving those biodiversity hotspots needs to be constructed. So as you can see, almost all, I'm sorry, almost all of Southern California is uh, really under that red, um, orange, or yellow um, coloring. As you can see, the Hawaiian Islands as well, because they are uh, islands, um, also have that specific issue. And the Appalachian Mountains, um, parts of Florida, and of course the, the um, Sierra region and up towards San Francisco. So here's kind of a zoom in on our little region. Um, and I just wanted to show you as we have several different ecoregions that come together in the Coachella Valley. So as you can see, you have the Colorado or Sonora Desert area, the Mojave Desert area up in that like green, yellow, the coastal sage scrub regions, and you have the montane regions in purple. Plus you have these transverse ranges that kind of extend across uh, California. And right there is where we are. So this is why this area is really important. Plus, as you can see, even from here, we have a, quite a bit of urban development. So here we have uh, an outline of what I call the um, outer boundary of our Coachella Valley Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan. I'm gonna to explain to you what that means in a second. Western Riverside also has a multiple species habitat conservation plan. And the reason for this was originally you had a, a very limited developed area in, 19, in the early 1980s. For those who grew up in this region, you know, it was still pretty rural right up until about the beginning of the 90s. And you, you still could ride horses around in a lot of places. You can here too on the urban wildland interface. But um, it was still quite, there a lot of farmland, a lot of alfalfa fields, um, quite a bit of, of uh, amazing rural industry still going on. But as people moved out from the Los Angeles County and Orange County and wanted to find a, a better and more um, what they felt a community feel or um, less crime or whatever they were looking for. Around the 1990s, everything started to change. Um, and the 1990s put a lot of urban development pressure on this region. And at that time, you know, more houses were needed, more jobs were needed to support this growing community of folks who were moving out from the urban areas. And as those developments went in, a lot of them went in haphazardly. There was no plan. Um, and that is kind of an interesting, um, an interesting way of developing without a plan. <laughs> so, um, there's a, so there was a real push to try to plan for future developments and also try to figure out if we could conserve some of these open spaces and the biology and the biodiversity in the area. By 2010, uh, the area looked like this. So you can see there's quite a bit of filled out by that time. And this is just shortly after both plans, so the both of those boundaries went into effect. And so I'm gonna back up here and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this guy. Um, and for those who have been out on the dunes um, and have been into um, Dr. Barrow's classes or the UCR classes talking about biodiversity and 
um, climate. This guy started it all out here. Uh, this is known as the Coachella Valley Fringe Toad Lizard. And he, they, uh, had these little fringes on their feet that allowed them to be highly specialized to the dune system that existed in this area um, until about the mid 80s, early 90s. So in 1986, because of rapid development moving in, there was the second habitat conservation plan under the Endangered Species Act that was um, identified for this area. Um, I should say the second conservation plan, habitat conservation plan in the United States was approved here in the Coachella Valley. Um, and it identified three preserve units, um, that larger green area, let's see if I can do this, larger green area here, as you know, um, the, there's a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service preserve out on uh, Washington and 38, the Thousand Palms area preserve. Um, this is called Willow Hole. Um, it is off of Mountain View and Varner. And then over here, you have everything between Indian and um, Palm Drive or Genotry Drive. Um, and this particular area is, you know, what we basically where we have sand moving through the system and into the larger dune system. That sand system is created by the Venturi wind effects. So you have a lot of pressure pushing uh, through the mountains. That's your mountain ranges, the San Jacinto, San Gregonio, and pushing from the coastal cool airs into the warmer valley airs. Um, you have this, one of the fifth, actually fifth windiest place in the world, that's what I understand. So naturally evolved through thousands of years, um, much of that sand got picked up from what we know as our river systems. And I'm sure so many of you know, uh, it blows through the air and into our sand dune system. Um, this particular sand dune was the original habitat polygon for the Coachella Valley fringe toad lizard. That was the massive dune. And if you look at old historic pictures of Palm Desert, Palm Springs area, you'll see the massive dune system that was out here. Right down the middle of that, from there to that, uh, we have created a situation where there's all just a lot of pressure. And we need houses, we need jobs, um, we need to be able to have the infrastructure to support our communities, but we're also blocking off a system that creates um, these sand dunes. So the original sand system here, these are the, the river systems, if you're familiar. We have white water coming down here, the San Gregonio River coming across this way in the white water floodplain. You have the Big Morongo and uh, Mission Creek waters coming down this way. And then out through here, you have a lot of flooding through Thousand Palms coming in from the, the different mountains. So if you've been out there in those alluvial fans, you know it's quite rugged. Um, and that those washes all come down here and actually uh, were part of this mesquite system that was down here. And we'll talk a little bit more about mesquite and that in a minute. So that's the waterborne. I'm sorry, that was a picture of white water. And then, of course, the, the, the winds picked up the water, a born sand, and they deposit it into these reserve systems. So you have uh, both sides of the freeway, these beautiful dune systems, and then down here, another dune system. So I want you to keep all of that in mind as I got, go back and tell you a little bit about the history after um, the original Habitat Conservation Plan. So one thing I had mentioned before is that we do need, you know, jobs, we do need infrastructure, we do need all of these things to help us live in this valley. But um, we are also 
many of you are here today, but we also love our open space. Um, we love the aesthetic of having the mountains um, free from development above us. We do love the aesthetic of having these open reserve lands, um, places you can walk your dog in some places, and then uh, you can go out with your kids and hike. So the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, um, as you heard that I, I work for, they are more of a regional joint powers authority, um, and they are in charge of looking into things of infrastructure programs where you would have regional issues. So all of the cities and the county and the three tribes in the area sit on the board, uh, the executive board of the CVAG, CVAG, Coachella Valley Association of Governments, and they specifically look into all of these different types of regional issues. And one of those was how the biodiversity was being affected by all of this different infrastructure. Another partner under the plan, the Co oh, it keeps doing that to me, the Coachella Valley Mountains Conservancy. They are a state-funded um, organization that was helped basically helped us acquire much of the land under the plan. So they go and they basically get an allocation from the state uh, under one of the conservancies, under the California Natural Resources Agency, um, that have the ability to go out and acquire land. Um, and as the 30 by 30 initiative gets to be more and more important, um, we're definitely looking at a quite a bit more um, allocation coming down from the state for that. But they have been instrumental in really uh, focusing acquisition in this area. And so what I'm showing you in this map here is that originally they were um, established in 1991, um, and that was their, uh, their original focus up through the, the blue thatch line. Um, but in 2008, when the, sign, when the plan was signed, they expanded their border to include everything in the MSHCP area. So, these two organizations, CVAG and CVMC, um, they really focused on trying to study what was going on in the area, and they did a feasibility study on something called a multiple species habitat conservation plan way back in 1994. And they came to the conclusion and the recommendation that instead of permitting for take, and I'll go through what that means in a second, for each and every project, infrastructure or housing um, for these species, that it would be much more efficient to put together our 27 species plan and a 27 different natural community plan and identify conservation areas where those uh, species could live and survive versus areas where we could develop and that we could encourage infrastructure and improve our roads. So it was a compromise. Now this is a lot of words, don't worry about what this says on the screen, um, but basically these are the definitions. And I just wanna show you a little bit here. A habitat conservation plan is a permitted plan, a planning document that is used by different jurisdictions to identify what species they can um, basically take for uh, certain authorized activities under the federal government. A natural community conservation plan is the state equivalent of that. So they have um, the Natural Community Conservation Act that they believe was passed in 2001. Um, and it was shortly after that that basically they wanted us to identify all of these natural communities. Now, if you don't know what a natural community is, it kind of sounds encompassing, right? It's completely just amorphous. But a natural community is really focused on the alliance and association levels of vegetation that we have in certain areas, and they define what you might call an ecosystem. So I promise that this history won't last very long. Ooh. 
I have in there? Oh, there we go. It really doesn't like me. So, uh, <laughs> so the landscape scale, uh, basically uh, the ability of all of us ecologists, developers, and um, focus for all of that type of conservation should happen at a landscape scale instead of a species by species decision, which is what the original habitat conservation plan for the fringe toad lizard was, right? Back in 1986. That was one species. This is covering everything in the sand community. Um, so it really is a landscape scale, not just looking at those preserved units, but the ecosystem processes that I just talked to you about, the, the fluvial and the aeolian sand transport, um, those processes are also incorporated into these preserved units. So we are focused on monitoring and management in these units. Um, there's a number of uh, research projects that are going on under the plan. Um, and we have a lot of partnerships and coordination. Um, and then we always look for different types of funding. So, oops, I should go that way. There we go. I'll do it right. So I know. Still going forward. All right, so this is just a brief timeline. Um, just to show you, it took a long time to get this into place. Um, you want to talk about difficulty between working in a government agency, working between jurisdictions can even be even harder. So we have a lot of compromise, a lot of discussions that was going on, and most of those discussions were, where are these conservation areas? What can we identify as the most sensitive areas that we need to conserve? And then, what areas can we develop in? And realize that's the compromise, right? So it's a lot more difficult to um, actually develop in the conservation areas than it is outside of the conservation areas. So in about 2008, our plan was finally approved. Um, and in 2015, it had to be amended um, for the final uh, incorporation of Desert Hot Springs and Mission Springs Water District. The CBCC was actually born, the Coachella Valley Conservation Commission, um, in December 1st, 2005. And unlike CVAG, it is also a joint powers authority. It's the one that runs the plan. It administers the plan requirements for both its permittees. But we have 1.1 million acres that we're supposed to be coordinating over, and about 700,000 of those acres are in a reserve system a little bit more than 200,000 acres is what's required for CVCC to acquire, or local permittees anyway. Um, and that basically has uh, um, an effect for 27 different species and 27 different natural communities. Um, basically, we have 18 permittees under the plan. Um, that's all of the cities the county, including waste management, um, county parks, and flood control. Oop, sorry, keeps working like that. Um, Caltrans, the Coachella Valley Mountains Conservancy, uh, Imperial Irrigation District, Water District, uh, Coachella Valley, and Mission Springs. So. We also coordinate with all of these other partners, including the Friends of the Desert Mountains, the um, Mojave Desert Land Trust, uh, Oswit Land Trust, and um, U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Bureau of Land Management, and the National Park Service. That's a lot of coordination. So let's go back to these ecosystem processes. Why are they so important? Well, as you can see, most of them are lying in low-lying areas or flood areas uh, throughout the valley. So each one had to kind of be identified and uh, drawn out on this original uh, plan. And it really does focus on 
um, this particular SAN system. So the cool thing about this plan is that you don't just get that uh, Coachella Valley fringe toad lizard um, conserved. We really do focus on every other species that's out there as well because they are no, no species exist in an envelope. Um, they have to actually exist in a community uh, just as we do. So uh, the Coachella Valley fringe toad lizard, here's the pop quiz here. Um, this is the black-tailed horned lizard um, that likes a little bit more uh, silty areas. Palm Springs pocket mouse, about the size of my thumb. This one, of course, is a sidewinder. It is not one of our covered species, where these three are. This is the Coachella Valley Jerusalem cricket. Um, this is a Miriam's kangaroo rat. And this one is a desert iguana, Coachella Valley uh, milk fetch. So this one, this one, this one, this one, and that one are covered under our plan. But these three highly benefit from <laughs> the fact that their habitat is undisturbed and they can also go about their business and uh, live a life in a preserved habitat. Yep. These are all the different species that are listed under the plan. Um, everything from desert tortoise to burrowing owl, Lacan's thrasher, uh, of course, the big peninsular bighorn sheep, um, Bristle Thrasher, we have the, well, that's another um, black-tailed horn lizard, Palm Springs pocket mice, the yellow-breasted chat, just beautiful, beautiful species, all of them. So each one, um, I should mention, there's plants up here too. So you have uh, the Mech Aster, um, the Coachella Valley Milk Vetch, and the triple rib milk vetch, along with the Orocopia sage, for those folks who really, really love plants, they always want me to talk about them. Um, and this is the little San Bernardino Mountains of Lenanthus. So what is a natural community? And we, I did mention this before. We have quite a bit uh, that is actually conserved in the, um, the valley. So we have uh, like palm oases, the sand scrub that you would see, I'm sorry, sand scrub, <laughs> the salt scrub <laughs> that you would see here on the right, along with mesquite hummocks, um, the dry wash woodlands, um, even just open creosote uh, mixed vege vegetation, um, and our sand dune, different types of sand dunes throughout the valley. Ephemeral sand fields, mesquite hummocks, desert salt bush, alien sand, stabilized sand fields, and riparian woodlands as well, too. Yep. All right, so what does it mean then? What are our requirements under the plan? You and I, anybody who lives in the valley, uh, you become, belong to one jurisdiction or another, and so you are also a part of this plan. We have our conservation areas, as you can see in color here across that plan boundary. Um, and in those areas, we basically call them reserve management units. One would be our alien sand fields. Um, two is our desert tortoise and linkage, or Joshua tree area. Three is our desert tortoise and linkage, excuse me. Four is our Dos Palmas area, which is a palm oasis, um, salt scrub community. And then six, of course, I'm sorry, five would be our stormwater channel area. Six is our San, um, San Bernino and San, I'm oh, sorry, excuse me, San Jacinto and Santa Rosa National Monument. Um, oh, I got it wrong again. Santa Rosa and San Jacinto National Monument um, area. And then basically each one of these has their own management plan or rule book where we have to go out and manage different types of things for these communities. Okay. So what does that mean? What our basic threats are in the management plans are 
things that are usually anthropogenic, but that means they were human caused. Um, and sometimes we can also see threats from other species. So invasive species, what we know as plants and animals that come from other areas that tend to take over or change the ecological regime of the, a particular area. So that is a, a threat. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about invasive species in a minute. Um, decreasing water table, something that's going on between our, between our feet and or beneath our feet, and we just don't really think about it. As we start to draw down water from our water table, a lot of the species that were here before us um, have less access to springs and um, the artesian springs particularly that would come up in the middle of the desert. So as we start to draw down, as we water our gardens, our um, different you know, landscaping, um, and or golf courses and or swimming pools, um, we are starting to take water from different systems. There's quite a bit of a recharge that's going on from the different water districts, but a lot of that recharge it will be slowing down this year or stopping because of what's needed um, for allocation along the Colorado River. So habitat loss, that's basic, um, ABCs, right? So if you're losing habitat to development or pollution, then they no longer can use it. Nitrogen de deposition, which is actually caused by the smog that rolls in through the valley uh, from the pass and the Los Angeles basin. And you keep seeing these air quality um, warnings from AQMD. Um, part of that is the nitrogen or the amount of nitrogen in the air, the NOx. Um, those nitrogen oxides can deposit upon the ground and actually act like a fertilizer and incorporate or uh, incorporate into the soil and then once they do that they can encourage our invasive species to outcompete our native species on top of that we have uh, basic shifts in habitat due to climate change or um, increase in fire frequency because of the invasive species so a lot of complexity, a lot of issues there. So what we do is we observe. We have uh, land managers and biologists who come together into the reserve unit, units and they basically observe what's going on out there. And once they observe um, something that might be a threat, we study it. And once that happens, we uh, bring back data and we say, what is this the threat? And if it is a threat, we try to take management actions to um, eliminate that threat. So this is a basic cycle of what's known as adaptive management. Um, and it's basically plan, observe, and then evaluate and respond. I'm sorry, my observe got cut off there. But there's a, there's a whole cycle here, an annual cycle that we, uh, we come together in these different reserve units to uh, look at the different threats and stressors to our species. Another thing that we're really concerned about is the, the corridors or the linkage um, between many of our reserve units. Um, we don't want genetic inbreeding of our, our critters or um, the fact that they can't get from one side of the highway to the other can be a serious issue. So um, not just for the big species, the sexy ones that you hear about, like the, the cougars and the big horn sheep, but also the small ones who tend to be corridor dwellers, like that little Palm Springs pocket mouse that I was telling you about. It can take several generations for them to move um, from one side of the highway to the other. Um, so they have um, a really limited capacity of, of adapting to something rapidly um, and shifting their habitat. So the big arrows on here are mostly our focused areas for corridor linkages. Um, the two on the east are desert tortoise and linkage areas. Um, those are the big, uh, many of them are big underpasses that go under the 10. 
There's a main linkage here between the Thousand Palm Preserve and Joshua Tree National Park, which is extremely important. The Indio Hills um, over to uh, basically Stebbins Dune, and then, um, sorry, um, yeah, Stebbins Dune, which is over here, and then um, into Willow Hole. Um, so that actually links up with our Mission Creek and then the little San Bernardino Mountains to the uh, San Bernardino Mountains over here. And then we have these little patches that go underneath the freeway here. And then the major linkage, this, these two actually link everything from Canada down to um, Mexico along that line. And actually the, the um, Pacific Crest Trail crosses at Stubby Canyon. So. Uh, that allows movement for larger species, or any species really, if they will uh, take the risk and move under the freeway to get to uh, habitat um, across the area and across the region. By the way, that's what Stuby Canyon looks like. Um, so you can see oh, on that, you have Finkel's finger coming down one side um, over here. I'm sorry, stop pointing. And so species are able to come down the ridge of the mountain and they could come under this. This isn't the only actual underpass, but this shows you at least one of the underpasses. And this was during a Caltrans work. They actually put pylons through here to stop people from driving in through there, so. We also focus on how these habitat patches are affecting our species. So habitat patches, of course, can cause genetic um, inbreeding um, if they're not able to get from one patch to the other. And so that's what our patches look like now of the sand dune habitat for the Coachella Valley fringe toad lizard. Um, and so we're starting to see some variations uh, that we're not quite sure if they're going to be affecting lizards, um, but as, as they become more and more genetically distinct, we're starting to see different types of phenotypes too, the coloration um, showing up on their um, skin. So basic uh, biology, looking at um, trying to understand what these traits are and how they're affecting the species. We're also very interested in what's going on with the mesquite dunes um, right now. Uh, specifically with the water table. Um, we are worried that many of our mesquite dunes have, um, are, are being threatened by not only the increase in um, some of the, the, the warm temperatures that are going on, both in the summer and the winter, um, but also just really looking at trying to understand how they're getting their water and why they keep dying off. So what is the stressors there? Um, we have mesquite dunes along the, the fault lines in the valley. So you'll see them in the palm oases. You'll see them out um, in the middle of the valley where you have um, more of a um, centralized fault line area in desert hot springs. Um, it's a branch of the San Andreas Fault, but it's not a main fault. And so, in those fault areas, you have the water that has actually, it can't, it can't permeate the fault, so it's pushed up. And that's why you have the palm oases and the mesquite dunes focused there. And these areas were culturally um, significant for thousands of years. Um, many species, including humans, uh, have depended upon them um, because they provide protein and they provide food sources and they're cooler underneath. Uh, so they are great places to live and great places to thrive. So what I wanted to show you here, this is some of the mesquite areas that we're looking at throughout the valley. Um, those mesquite areas, many of them have died off. This one, that one is mostly dead. This one is dying over here. This one's known as fault line dunes. This one's still rather healthy, but it's starting to show signs of stress. And this is our healthiest mesquite area <laughs> in the valley, the Thousand Palms Preserve. So um, a lot of that uh, has to do with the amount of um, 
probably the water drawdown that we can understand. But also, as, as you probably have heard, plants, um, as they become more stressed for water, become threatened by other things, such as disease and insects and another, and so might be a compounding factor. Um, so we are looking at mesquite restoration throughout the valley. What I don't show you here is that these are mesquite dune systems. Further down in the valley at the base of the, in the stormwater channel and delta conservation area, that area is covered in mesquite in many places, and that's because the water table is so high there. Um, but those are known as mesquite bosques, so they're slightly different. In, in this area, the sand has um, blown up and around the mesquite plants so that it, the mesquite are pushed further and further uh, away from their main roots. Um, and so they have like these uh, more difficult types of trying to survive in a, in a dune system where um, it can be pretty harsh out there in the winds. Another thing we do is a lot of vegetation mapping. So we do outline where these communities exist. Um, and we pay biologists, ecologists, botanists to go out into the field and identify when many of these um, spaces look like. And uh, if we can identify change, that would be awesome because change is really what we're after. Um, if it's not changing and we're not seeing rapid change in one way or the other, um, then we know we're doing our job and, and trying to preserve these habitats. And of course, uh, species surveys throughout the valley. Um, I just like to show the desert tortoise stuff because um, everybody loves desert tortoises. But um, we have many different types of uh, monitoring going on. Some of them are we're just trying to figure out where the species exists. Um, when the plan was developed, we used observations that were identified in museums to uh, basically create habitat uh, models that allowed us to identify where we could find these species. Um, and as, you know, the 13 years later that we've done, 13, 14 years later? Yeah, I guess 14. Um, there really is quite a bit that's been uh, learned about many of these species in, in terms of where they exist and where they move to and how they use corridors. And one of those is our studies on desert tortoises. So the desert tortoises are, they have a little radio that's attached to them. Um, and they're used radio telemetry to, uh, to track them through areas um, like this one. And the only reason I'm showing you this is because it's several years down the road, so many of these guys have moved on. Um, they are uh, focused on, you know, finding all kinds of sign for a desert tortoise. So not just where we find the tortoises and where you get their radio telemetry um, signals, but also where you're finding um, their shells and signs of death, stress, um, and any kind of other signs that they can use um, to identify how they might be moving. In this particular study, they found that they were moving up the ridges more, and we were finding a lot of death in the lowlands of the area, um, and, and specifically females. So they were putting all of their energy into what we believe they were putting all of their energy into making eggs, and, um, and unfortunately, all of that water and the moisture that they had in their bodies was depleted through that, and they probably had more stress on them than the males did. But these two areas are our highest um, incidences of desert tortoises. And so we have two different problems here. Out here, we have a major issue with climate change. We have a lot of tortoises moving up into the ridges, the more rugged areas. Out here, um, we have an issue with invasive species. So both areas have pretty, you know, good populations of tortoises, but the invasive species here can be a threat for fire and the demographics of the, of the tortoises. And out here, really, I'm not sure how we fight climate change other than 
um, working together as a, as a community to try to uh, reduce emissions. But it is getting hotter and drier in the lowland areas here. And so it's, it's, we're finding less and less of them out there. So again, I'm, I'm, this is the big one for us, trying to understand what climate change is doing um, and how our species are going to move um, in regards to this. This was created by UCR, this graphic, and it really does look like um, urban heat island effect here. But um, as you can see, you know, the area down in here is going to get a lot warmer over time. So this is a prediction. Um, and at this point, like most of our area looks like it's this color, and this is in the future, so it's going to be this color. So we're looking at three or four degrees um, increase in winter temperatures on average, um, and if we hope, not three degrees Celsius, right? Um, <laughs> so we're, you know, we've got some problems. Um, and as the species uh, feel that stress, they're going to try to find the same climate envelope that they're in. Um, and they're going to push up in elevation, or they'll push uh, basically into more wetter areas, uh, or they'll completely not be able to move, and they won't be able to adapt, um, and they'll be eradicated. So, on top of that, we have recreational management. So, we have a trails management plan that has a uh, focus mostly on the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto National Monument. I got it right that time, yay. Um, and it really does focus on access to tra trails um, and how they affect Peninsular Bighorn Sheep. Um, and we really don't know. I mean, we're, we're kind of finding out that they do, uh, it depends. So we do find a lot of threats to bighorn sheep in, in areas where you have recreation that is not, um, not something that they recognize and not something that is predictable. Risk assessment in species is, seems to be a very interesting subject. And as one set of bighorn can really see a lot of threat from you walking up the path versus uh, the other set of bighorn who are like, oh, it's just them again. That is, it's very, very different. And so trying to find a predictive study on how animals are going to react to recreational use, is, it's, it's very interesting. We want to make sure that we are getting people outdoors. I know Friends of the Desert Mountains, one of their missions is really to start to educate and do edu outreach to many of the communities um, in the valley so that we can get folks interested in these areas and loving these areas and interested in continuing a 75-year plan to conserve these areas and others. So um, we need that enhanced recreation for those opportunities to educate and do the outreach to the communities and provide those uh, different types of opportunities for folks who just need to get out of the city and want to be able to enjoy uh, the wilderness around them. And um, the big, you know, the big controversy here is really how are we recreating and what is too much? You know, can we love it to death? Um, that is kind of where we are. So we're looking at a number of those different things under our trails management plan. And we have a trails management subcommittee that tries to analyze each one of those issues. So as you probably know, we have more than 140 plus trails in this area. Um, this on its own is just one huge um, employment opportunity, hopefully, for a coordinator or somebody else to come um, and work with us and um, try to help us understand um, how we can ma better manage the trail. Right now, just improving our trail system, such as trail heads and um, encouraging interpretational materials and opportunities for folks to learn more about these areas is what we're focused on. And trying to make sure that they are 
you know, any kind of impacts to the species that we can um, work with just right off the bat are taken care of. So we have um, the milk fetch over here on the right. And I believe, you know, that's chemical trail. So um, we had, when we created that trail, we had to make sure that we were uh, identifying areas where the species would not be. But then the milk vetch liked the trail so much that they seem to be growing right, right around the trails. So we have to make sure that folks are hopefully um, respecting those uh, sensitive species in those areas. And invasive species management. I'm sure many of you have been out um, on the trail and seen species that don't ex shouldn't exist in the area um, and could be a, a problem for many of our, our, our particular species. So I think um, I do a lot of this. And if you're interested in fountain grass removal or tamarisk removal um, or mustard removal, please come speak to the Friends of the Desert Mountains or the Cocha Valley Conservation Commission. We'd be glad to help you uh, understand more about the ecology in the area. Um, these species moved in from, usually from the Africa or um, the, the Middle East. Um, they were brought here uh, for many different reasons. Um, and they just really uh, thrived in our areas and outcompete many of our neighbored species. So briefly, the tamarisk can drink more water than the mesquite. It can reduce its, uh, the mesquite's intake of, of local water sources. Uh, fountain grass, the same thing. Um, it's spread throughout our, our different um, canyons and it infiltrates water holes that the peninsula bighorn sheep can use as well as the tamarisk does. And so we remove them, we try to remove them from the water holes so that there's more water available for the wildlife that are out there. Plus they, you know, they grow really big. And if you've been on one of these fountain grass pools in some of those wilderness areas, you'll know that, um, they, you know, they, they're perfect habitat for lions to hide in while peninsula bighorn sheep are trying to drink. This is a picture on the, oops. the picture on the left is Saharan mustard out at the preserve. That is 2005, that's when it really hit hard. Um, and it became a monoculture out there. Now, you have native species that are trying to exist underneath that monoculture, but until you pull them, they're really not able to get sunshine or any kind of precipitation. I will get this right eventually. But that's what it looked like before the Saharan mustard. So all of these beautiful wildflowers are trying to exist underneath those species. And the Saharan mustard doesn't just exist, it changes the ecosystem structure. So it stabilizes the dunes and it causes um, less, of, less and less of the habitat to actually be available for our native species. That's quite a contrast. So, I'll wrap up here quickly and say a lot of what we deal with is uh, pollution and illegal dumping. When we acquire land, we clean it completely um, and then we uh, inspect it every year. And as you have probably noticed, illegal dumping is pretty prevalent out here in open spaces. So our jurisdictions and many of the neighbors seem to love us because we go out and try to clean up as much as possible. Um, now, the Friends of the Desert Mountains, they led this volunteer effort years ago. This is a big Morongo Canyon. Um, but these were volunteers from the North Face. Um, I'm not even sure if they're still uh, in business now. But yeah, um, we'll, we'll use whatever volunteers we can to help get these done. We also have a partnership with Desert Recreation District um, to help manage some of these lands, uh, as well as the Desert Hot Springs Police Department. and. Um, you know, throughout the area, the sheriff's department as well. Uh, we do some fencing, and this particular fencing went in right as people were dumping. <laughs> so we have a lot of before and after pictures here. Um, the post and cable fencing is really, it's not effective in trying, in, in making sure people stay out. 
um, and we want people to enjoy the lands. So the only thing here we're worried about is off-road vehicle use and illegal dumping. Um, and this particular area right here, there's a lot of milk vetch that goes right there. And I have pictures of it. It's really cool. Um, but this road, before we put the fencing up, was covered in dumping. And now, um, especially since COVID and the stay-at-home order, we've had um, repeated vandalism out here. So we're focusing more of our effort on that urban wildland interface and working with the Desert Hot Springs Police Department to um, try to, in, you know, integrate a little bit of patrolling in this area so that uh, folks aren't so easy to destroy what's out there. And then outreach and education. Um, I spend a good amount of my time trying to do a lot of interpretation for folks and, and trying to do some outreach and um, try to come and speak in different avenues to try to understand uh, what people think about the desert, what I can improve on and what we can improve on and trying to help you understand why we're doing this. So um, we do a lot of it. We reach out to the schools. We have a partnership with College of the Desert, um, the Living Desert, Urban Conservation Corps, um, and UCR, and trying to understand what folks need in, in learning about climate change, learning about conservation and ecology. And really just getting folks out there, right? So um, if you contact me, I'd be happy to put you in contact with many of these organizations that could use your help as a volunteer or um, students for the College of the Desert. I teach three classes there and I know others in natural resources who teach classes there as well. I teach wildlife management, ecosystem management and careers in natural resources and agricultural sciences there and have for a little over 10 years now, so. And getting students, uh, local students involved is, is kind of a specialty um, and a love of mine. So uh, I want students to go and study ecology. I want them to come back because we do have a 75 year plan. We have all of these different organizations that can provide wonderful green careers. Um, and so trying to get them incorporated into just the economy of the valley and um, invested in our conservation lands is a, is a driver for me. All right, so without further ado, I will take maybe five minutes or so of questions. I'm sorry, I probably went over, but there you have my, um, my email address, and you can always visit our website at the cvmshcp.org um, and read more about the documents and the maps and all kinds of stuff, so thank you. What is the approximate uh, population of the bighorn sheep? So as um, we are waiting for the final population estimate for this year, um, and one of the questions that we have is what that actual number is. I heard it was just under 1,000 last time, but that was a couple years ago. It's been a little while since they've done a full population estimate. So um, if you keep, if you keep a, a aware of my, our website, We'll probably be posting that pretty soon, so. Yes. Well, well hello, James. <laughs> Hi, Katie. <laughs> so given all of what you've spoken about, um, are you optimistic for the future? You could speak about uh, the plan as a whole or the Coachella French toad lizard, whatever you feel is most accurate. Am I optimistic for the future? Yes, and I'll tell you why. This 30 by 30 initiative could be um, very, very encouraging um, if we're looking at trying to preserve natural and working lands to sequester carbon over time. Um, I'm also optimistic that people, once they learn to care about something, they do tend to change their environmental behaviors. But, you know, there is a lot of energy that has to go into that. And um, I think there needs to be investment in ecology and education throughout the country 
um, and throughout the world. So I, I, I am hopeful that um, things will start to change, maybe the paradigm shift. Um, but as, as a valley, as a region, I think we're doing a great job, so. <laughs> okay. uh, you mentioned a couple of times acquiring mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. uh, what land do you acquire and what are you actually looking for? Is it to prevent development or what is it? It's not to prevent development. So anything that's in the conservation areas, you can go to our website and look up a parcel. Um, if it's in the conservation areas, it is something that we would like to acquire. Uh, we give you a fair about fair market value for your home, so it would be go through an appraisal. Um, and if you wanted to uh, sell the land to the conservation plan, then we would acquire the land that way. Um, we are looking for specific pieces of land that don't have a lot of issues and or like um, structures, I guess you would say, on them. Um, we will remove structures and we'll help you clean up the land if we need to. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity um, to also split parcels if you wanted to keep part of the land with a structure on it. Um, we had that happen down at North Shore Ranch. Uh, we had an opportunity to buy almost 160 acres um, of a previous duck club, and the owner had his ranch on it as well, so he uh, split the parcel. Um, basically, and gave us all of the open space and kept uh, uh, like a fishing pond and a couple places for him to to hang out and work on his ranch. So, um, so to answer your question, um, yes, we are looking for areas that are always in the conservation areas. Uh, we don't acquire land outside of the conservation areas, but our partners will: um, Oswit Land Trust and Mojave Desert Land Trust. I believe Friends is more focused on management and education now, um, but we, if you are interested in selling a parcel, I guess the, the short answer is, uh, please feel free to give us a call and we, we'll tell you what's, uh, what's possible, so. One I more question, I think. I should, I should add to that, we're almost 50% to our goal of 226 some thousand acres. So we acquired just over 100,000 acres of our goal already. When you showed the map of the different zones and regions, I think there were six of them. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if any of those include native lands and how you interface with the native population. It's an excellent yeah. question. Uh, so n there are no tribal lands in our plan, um, in our identified conservation areas. Uh, the Agua Caliente have their own conservation plan. Um, and we do interface with the Torres Martinez and the Morongo uh, nations, but we don't incorporate any of those into our conservation areas in plans. So they're basically their lands are sovereign and they make a choice of what's going on and what doesn't go on on their land, so. Um, with that said, uh, I'd like to see more interface with the tribes, particularly with cultural easements, as I mentioned with mesquite. Um, something that I'm terribly interested in is how uh, the mesquite has evolved in this area to, uh, to, w to be managed by um, the tribes and the humans. Um, so we are looking at trying to uh, integrate some of those learning opportunities for us to learn from tribal ecological knowledge um, and to in, in just encourage others to realize that um, the tribes have been here for thousands of years and they've really had an effect on uh, much of our ecology, so. I think that's about our time, so please help me uh, thank Kathleen one more time. Thanks for coming thank out. You. Thank you everyone for coming.